Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Airdrie, Alberta Councillor Tina Petro. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you to our countless subscribers and our countless listeners and viewers. We couldn't do this show without you. Your your engagement, your follows, your likes helps us get the word out. So if you can, head over to our Facebook page, our Threads page, our Instagram page, our X page, and hit the subscribe button or follow button. You don't want to miss updated information as we provide it. We have stories constantly coming out, but we also have behind the scenes looks of what's going on here at the Cross Border Interview Studios. So if you can, scroll down, hit the links, and be sure to subscribe. Now, on to our interview. I want to thank you so much, Tina, for sitting down with me and chatting about yourself and talking about the city of Airdrie. And I want to start with the generic question. And as you have listened to the show, you know what the question is going to be. So let's jump right into it with where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Tina? Uh, you know, I, I, I was born with that. My I grew up in a household that volunteered for everything. Um, my mom was involved with everything. And I think that that sense of giving back has been instilled in me since I was a very young child. Um, I, we grew up in a farming community and we relied on food banks every once in a while and stuff like that. So it just, it became part of our nature that if somebody else was helping you, you always give back. So it sounds like you did not grow up in the city of Airdrie. Do you mind me asking where, 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 where Tina sowed her oats and grew her seeds of volunteerism <laughs> and giving back? All of Western Canada. So I was born, <laughs> I was born in Saskatchewan, a little farming community. Uh, shout out to Waka, Saskatchewan. Okay. Uh, um, we, I moved from there when I was five. We, I grew up in central Okanagan. So I was in Revelstoke for a little bit, then Vernon Armstrong and spent the majority of my life in Armstrong, uh, then graduated and moved out to Alberta and have been here ever since. So, Wow. So yeah. I, I guess the general question has to be asked then. So how does a girl from Waukes, Saskatchewan, become a city councillor in Airdrie, Alberta? So was, uh, was municipal politics discussed around the table? Like, is this something that you would always want it to be involved in municipally? Or where, no. did, you, where did you get your passion for municipal politics? Um, how many hours do we have here? Um, <laughs> you, so, as long as you want. So I'll tell you. So, so the quickest or the longest short version of my backstory is when I was a little kid, about seven years old, I decided I wanted to be a horse veterinarian. And that is all I wanted to do with my life. I was a horse rider for years. And so all through elementary school, middle school, high school, I did everything to become that, uh, that horse vet. So dropped all the fun electives, didn't do all the fun stuff. Cause I was always such a homework nerd. I was always studying, especially science, math, English, all those, um, got top academics in my school growing up. Um, I think three years in a row, actually, it was great. Um, math whiz. I was uh, tutoring grade 12s and grade nine. It was phenomenal. So I was really on my way to getting to that, to that goal. And in grade 11, I was uh, conditionally accepted into a horse veterinary program. Um, all I had to do was maintain my grades. Uh, and then grade 11, I had uh, some medical trauma. So my lung collapsed, my heart stopped. Um, I was out of school for probably most of grade 12, like really in and out of school. So obviously I did not maintain my grade average. I almost didn't graduate. <laughs> uh, and then, so my, my life path just kind of went sideways, right? So um, I started working right out of school um, and really just fell into things. Like um, I've always been a firm believer that there is a plan for every single one of us. You just have to keep saying yes to the opportunities when they come before you. Um, so while I always thought my duty was to save animals, it turns out it was to um, help people and, and help people to achieve what they needed to achieve. So um, never paid attention to politics in my life. Um, so I'm catching up at lightning speed over the last six years. Um, but it actually started, I was, um, I run an event planning company and I was our mayor's events manager when he ran for MLA in 2015. Um, so I went through all of the conservative boot camp that they do. And it was really cool to see it um, from the inside. And then I realized that, that is, is, is exactly where I can make an impact. So two years later, I threw my hat in the ring and now I'm here. 
So um, I actually did find out, I didn't, I didn't know this growing up. My dad was actually an alderman uh, from 1984 to 1988 in Saskatchewan. I had no idea. Um, he pulled that certificate just out of his hat shortly after I got elected. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So yeah, so it, I guess it was always maybe predetermined, but yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start <laughs> with the 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 election six years ago because this is coming out almost six years to the day when you got that green check mark beside your name saying that you are councillor elect for the city of Airdrie. Now, there's been a lot that has happened over the last six years as a councillor. And I can imagine when you first put your name for it, you did not think there was going to be a global pandemic. You did not think there was going to be an affordability crisis, this, that, and the other. Um, when you just, when you were on the outside looking in, what were you expecting the role to be like? Because you, you kind of uh, just openly admitted that you didn't really follow politics until you got involved in the progressive conservative campaign for the uh, conservative candidate in the area. So what were you expecting the municipal world to be like when you got elected or when you decided to put your name for it six years ago? Well, I'll as I mentioned, I'm a homework nerd and I'm a researcher to no end. <laughs> so before I even made the decision... I sat down with all of our current counselors. I sat down with all of the directors in the city. I sat down with the city manager at the time um, because I really wanted to make sure that I knew what I was getting myself into. I mean, holy cow, there's so many things that nobody tells you, right? And you do learn them as you go. But I felt as far as what Airdrie was facing at that time and what um, what I was going to be um, drenched with with the fire hose, I, I felt like I had a fairly good understanding of that. Um, fairly good understanding of what our issues were, where we were sitting, um, how the city was was functioning at that point in time, um, and also a bit of, um, you know, what was happening at our provincial level. Not as much federal. I didn't really step into the federal realm there right at the beginning. Um, but yeah, just kind of I researched as much as I could. So I had a pretty good idea going in. Um, obviously, there's been tons of things that have happened. Um, but I've always had a philosophy, you roll with it. Whatever happens, you just roll with it. You figure it out, you roll with it, and you keep going. Um, and I think that's been what's got me through the last six years is that you don't, if it comes at you, you just figure out what you need to do in that moment. And how do you need to move forward to the next step, to the next step, to the next step? So it does do you remember that overall. campaign in 2017? Yes, yes. Okay, good, because now I can ask this question. If you said no, then I would have had to ask a different question, but now I can ask this question. Going out and door knocking is a unique experience uh, in itself because you you are actually going out and asking people what they believe in, what their what their issues are, and for someone like yourself who had been semi active event planner for conservatives, yeah, I'm assuming you had a pulse in your community. But when you hear people actually talk about the struggles they're going through and the struggles that they have, that's a different, unique beat in itself. For you, what were you hearing at the doors in 2017 and then transpose that to 2021? I know COVID-19 didn't really do much door-to-door, uh, -door, quote unquote. Were they the same issues or were they more uh, different issues compared to the next election in 2021? Well, so, okay, so to answer the first campaign part, I probably would step back a couple of years. So we moved to Airdrie in 2012 and I jumped into volunteering as soon as we got here. So I think I was volunteering with about 12 or 13 different organizations from the time we moved here till, till the time I ran for our election. So I had a fairly good idea from talking to everybody what, like how people were doing and what their concerns were and where they were struggling and where they were thriving. So I think at the door in 2017, there wasn't a lot that shocked me. Um, because it's, okay. it's what I had been hearing for the last, you know, three, four years at that point in time. Um, a lot of it was, I mean, at that time, it was a little bit simpler. It was, you know, <laughs> we, need better, we need better snow removal, our, where, you know, our east-west connections, they're not where they should be, our road network, we need a hospital. Hospitals always top of, top of the thing. So those conversations um, are always fun to have, because at that time, I didn't totally know how to navigate that conversation with the relationship with the provincial government and municipal government. Um, so that was more about just taking in that information and listening to what people needed. Um, so it was very municipal focused um, in 2017. 2021, <laughs> I do not think that I got one municipal related question until seven days before the actual election. Everything prior to that was my stance on 
COVID, COVID vaccines, masking. Um, and so it, it was, you could see where everyone's mindset was obviously, because it was the biggest thing that everyone was dealing with, no matter what side of the conversation you were on. But it was a little disheartening. And I tried to remind people, I said, please don't make your decision based on people's stance on these things, because this is a short period of time. I said, these people that you're electing, they will be governing for you for four years. And this is a very small portion of that time because I had my fingers crossed that we were almost out of it at that time, um, which it wasn't too far off. We were about six months out. But, um, but I said, yeah, I mean, all these people are still gonna have to make decisions for you about your budgets and your, your snow removal and your roads and all those things. So yes, find your philosophical like alignment um, with, it, with this issue, but also pay attention to what these people have been doing over the past, you know, four years, five years, six years, what, what they've been doing in your community, what their stance on other things was, because it'll be important. So yeah, so that was pretty much the difference, just not really municipal focused in 2021. Okay, you bring up, you you just brought up my favorite yeah. subject, and that is jurisdictional roles of municipalities. Now you've been in the role pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, and the role has changed. Municipal councillors across Canada, I'm hearing from, are saying that the role and the issues that you're being approached with are completely uh, from federal issues to provincial issues to municipal issues to school board issues to international issues. How do you balance that? Because you understand that your role and your jurisdictional authority is municipal roads, yeah. sewage, wastewater, all the fun, sexy things that we talk about on a regular basis. But residents, don't really see that jurisdictional borders. They just want you to talk about whatever they want to talk about. So how do you balance the the conversations with people and the issues that people bring to you? Well, a um, couple of different things. First of all, I give our MPs and MLAs a lot of heck all the time because I said, <laughs> everything that you guys are doing is coming to me all the time. So I will always provide contact information for people for things that are not within my, my jurisdiction. But I think at the end of the day, people need to be heard. And we are the level of government that sometimes good and sometimes bad can hear you. We're right here. And if I can give someone, you know, a half an hour of my time and they can vent about federal issues, I'm happy to listen. And I'm happy to say, you know what, I can't help you with this, but I can take you to this person. Or I'm happy next time I'm chatting with them to bring your opinion forward. Like, um, just explaining that our role can be advocacy. So I can take your concerns that aren't, that aren't my jurisdiction, but I can still tell somebody about them because you can't tell them yourself. But I can also give you their email address. I can give you where to go. Um, and then, you know, some of the conversations get a little heated and controversial and so sometimes it's applying logic to those conversations like um i'm i'm not even going to go into some of them because i don't want to open up some cans of worms no here, no but, but i want to talk about something you just brought up there because you're right you are the closest to the people you make a decision the day after you make it it impacts them you don't yeah. go to edmonton to do your job you don't go to ottawa to do your job I want to talk about the personal private life of a counselor, especially a local counselor, because you go to the grocery store. You're not Tina. You'll never be just Tina yeah. until you leave public office. You're counselor. Yeah. Have you found after six years a, a sweet balance of being Tina some days when you're out with the family and knowing that you're counselor as well? And if someone comes up to you, you may have to tell them. I'm with my family right now. I, I wish I could chat with you. Here's my business card. Call me tomorrow and I'm happy to talk. Or are you one of those counselors that likes to talk with them no matter what day of the week is or where you are? <laughs> Probably more of the second one. I will <laughs> say that for the first four years, nobody knew who I was. Like Airdrie is this really, um, it's this really funny place where most of the people that I door knocked, they thought our mayor was Nenchi for the longest time. Like they had no idea that they had their own council here. Um, so for the first four years, I got recognized very few times when I was out in public and, you know, I could go and do anything I needed to do. Um, I, my, my husband runs a creative agency. So when we go to do campaigns and marketing and stuff, like he's a genius with it and he's, and he's very talented. Um, and one thing we identified very early on, is even with the 2017 campaign, was that most people didn't know me by name, they knew me by face. And so all of my signs always had my face on them. So um, in the 2021 election, it was so embarrassing, but 
kids were playing. I, I got messages from parents that their kids were playing Find the Tina around the community. And uh, so they were looking for these faces of Tina everywhere. And we had t-shirts like it was really, it was really embarrassing. I'm not somebody, I don't like having my picture out there, but I understand it's a necessary part of the job. Um, but yeah, so after the last campaign, um, it's a lot more. Like when you go to stores, you do get recognized a lot more, you get stopped. And um, my family will just kind of ditch me. When they see me get in a conversation with a resident, they'll just leave because they know that I'm not gonna end that conversation in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I, like I said, if I can give people my time, that is the that is the one thing, it's free for me to do that. I can give that to them anytime. Um, so I do feel a little bit of a sense of obligation to give my time to residents. Um, so yeah, my family just ditches me almost all the time. Um, I, I, I feel like I've done a very good job of separating my personal life from my council life. So. I have, sorry, multiple um, social media channels. I, I don't, I, I don't put pictures of my children, my house, my husband, anything like that out there ever. And that's a choice that I've made for safety. Um, so it's, it's trying to find that balance because I know that people do like to see you with your family and, and that, but I, I choose to keep mine very private. I, I want to talk about the apathy aspect because you just mentioned it a little bit there that in 2017, you you, you kind of said that people didn't know your name, they knew your face, but in 2021, they may have known your name as well. Um, do you believe that there's an apathy when it comes to municipal governance? Like when you are at, when people are asking you questions or talking about their issues, are they talking about the important issues that are in front of council, like in the agenda package, or are they talking about their potholes or are they talking about why their taxes are so high? Do you see an apathy or even engagement issue with the uh, your residents when you say, OK, I have an issue or I have something coming in front of council. I need some feedback from the general public. Can you give me feedback? Will, would people be willing to give their feedback in Airdrie? Um, it's, it's, it's really split and it depends which pocket of people you're talking to. There is sure. some that are very tuned in. They're very engaged. Um, those ones, like we have one guy who has come and sit in almost every single council meeting that I've ever been in. And he just yeah. sits there and he just listens and he just takes notes. Um, so there are some people that are very dialed in. They know what's going on and they will come and hit you with those hard hitting questions about, you know, that bylaw that's coming forward here. Um, the rest of the population if nothing's going wrong, you're never going to hear from them. Um, I think the numbers from our elections really speak to that. Like, I think our last election was 25% voter turnout. The one before that was 22. And the one before that, there was no mayoral race because our mayor was acclaimed and it was 18%. Like, it's 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 pitiful how engaged people are with politics. Um, and I don't actually, I don't actually even know if that's just an apathy, but it's the it's the communications that happens in our community. So we have 50% of our labor force that leaves this community every day. So they read the papers in Calgary, they read the or they listen to the radio stations in Calgary, they watch TV there, they shop there. They, um, those are the people that think that Nenshi's their mayor, right? That that they just they they don't fully understand um, their own community because they don't have any time to engage with it. So that has been one of my biggest goals since I got elected was to re-engage people with the community that they live in show them how's that going here. um it, it's progressing right so oh, i think good. um we have a couple counselors on our council that are very active on social media and that let people know what's going on um and i think people are starting to connect with that a little bit um more so than they were four or six years ago um but even our even our communications department internally has started to step it up and instead of just reporting on the news as it happens, it's a, hey, did you know? Hey, uh, I think we put out one a little while ago was, you know, it was a question, which one of these things is your level of government responsible for? Um, so we're getting there, but I, I, my, my feeling is until we have an app, like an Airdrie app on everyone's phone that pushes notifications out, I don't think we'll ever get there with communication just because the way we're set up. Plus, and this is from a communication standpoint, as a former communications person for municipality here in Alberta, 
even if communication, in, in, even if you communicate till you're blue in the face, there's always going to be people who just say, I didn't hear about it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you're never going to communicate to a hundred percent of the people. I don't care how hard you try and how yeah. much money you throw at it. It's never going to happen. And we got to stop thinking we should. Anyway, there's my rant yeah. for the day. Yeah. I, I want to talk about the role of counselor before we turn into segment two. And I wanted to ask because over the last six years, you've had to deal with some pretty tough issues. And I'm assuming there, there's days when you know you're not going to please 100% of the people when you make votes. Yeah. Um, when you go into that council chamber, when you have that agenda the Friday before or the day before or whenever the agenda package comes in, comes to the councillors, how much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you're informed on what the issues are that are in that agenda package? communicate with the people that are in your community to understand where they're coming from, but realize at the end of the day, the decision falls on your shoulders. You have to make that tough choice. How much weight is that on you every time you walk into that council chambers? Uh, okay. Before I answer that, I feel like this might be a good time to throw my disclaimer in there that everything that I say here is my personal views and does not reflect. That's, the that, that was the next or, question that I was going to talk about. That, that, yeah. That's the next question. Yes. But I could do that right now, right here, right now, if you want. For those who are listening, this, this is a conversation between me and the counselor. This is not a motion of counsel, not the decision of counsel, not the policy of counsel. This is the, the opinion of counselor Petro. And I hopefully pronounced that last name correctly. I think I yes. did. And yeah. if I didn't, I apologize. This is the, this is a conversation between the cross border interviews and counsel. Councilor Petro of the city of Airdrie. That's not a motion of council, a decision of council, or a policy of council. There we go. There's the disclaimer put out there. Excellent. I love it. Uh, I, sometimes I remember to do it at the beginning, and sometimes I'm like, oh, we're getting to that part of the interview. Okay, I'm going to do it right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, so I am, I, I am what is known as an empath. If you can't tell throughout this conversation, I am emotional about many, many, many things. Um, I actually just finished an interview about my hiking right before this and was crying through almost the whole thing. So um, I will say that I probably carry more weight from the decisions than a, than a person should. Um, but, but again, I'm a research nerd. So I always, I will make sure that I am 100% informed on something before I make a decision. And if I don't feel comfortable that I have enough information, I'll ask to table it, I'll ask for more information, whatever that takes, because I never wanna make a decision that I'm not informed on. Um, so, and there's that balancing act, right? There's the balancing act between the information that you're provided, information that you research on your own and your residents' um, voices and opinions. There's, there's, a, there's a tough line to walk there because sometimes you can have, the public doesn't always have every piece of information that they need to make a good governance decision. So taking their opinions and their thoughts towards it and really applying that towards the research that you've done and knowing everything else, like all the other budgetary impacts that are gonna come from this decision or how this is gonna affect another policy that maybe they didn't even think about. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces to it, but I will say I take things, I think I take things to heart more than I should and I carry decisions for way longer than a person should. Um, yeah. I, is, it, is it hard? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, some. Does it some get easier things, after six years or is it still the no, same pressure? No, because every issue is different, right? And and you you can't carry one thing to another thing to another thing because they're all so vastly different and they affect different people. And so if you're thinking about the people that they affect, it never gets easier, ever. Does respect come into play a little bit there? Because I can imagine that you probably have heard from both sides of the story on many issues. And you have to, because you are an elected official, you you respect the people, you respect the people who have voted for you, even the people who haven't voted for you because you did not get 100% of the votes. Uh, it, it's just the way that the world works. Is there a respect that comes into play when you're out and people say, I have an issue with one of your votes that you made. Can we talk about it? Do you, do you give that time that we talked about a little bit later, earlier in that same situation where people may be upset with how you voted or how you or put you, how you voted on a certain issue or even a budget? Oh, 100%. Um, I, I encourage it, actually. I encourage people. <laughs> if, if they don't like something that I'm doing, the only way I'm going to know that is if they come and talk to me about it. Yeah. Um, so to give you an example, um, I don't engage in comment sections on social media. It's just a practice Thank that you. I don't do. I Thank feel you. that it Good I feel <laughs> that well, I feel that there's a good like eight to ten comments that are generally productive, and then it just falls off the wagon there. So I will 
private, if I feel that there's somebody who maybe just doesn't have the right information or needs to talk, I'll private message them and say, hey, you know, my name's Tina, I'm a counselor with the city. Looks like you might need something. Did you want to chat? Did you want a phone call, coffee, whatever? I have reached out to over 600 residents. I will tell you that two of them have taken me up on that offer, just two. Um, but I think we can't grow unless we figure out what we're doing wrong. And I may not agree with somebody on it, but I really value the perspective because maybe it's something that I didn't think of. And that has happened to me many times where I've, you know, I've read something and I've formulated some kind of opinion on it or a decision. And then somebody comes to a public hearing and they're like, well, what about this? And I'm like, oh my God, never in a million years would I have thought of that. So it's totally altered my, my opinion on that. So I really appreciate those conversations. And I always encourage residents, like, if you don't like something that I did, I'll generally respond. If you tell me you don't like it, I'll always respond to you. Please take me up on the offer to chat about it because I need to understand where you're coming from. So so it doesn't always work, but I do offer it. I want to turn to the city as a whole now. And I already prefaced this, but I'm going to preface again because I, I try to make sure that I you know let people know that this part is your opinion. Uh, the next question is a uh, conversation between uh, Councillor Petro, Petro and myself. This is not a motion of council, a direction of council, or a policy of council. Ever since Brooks uh, Councillor Marissa Wardrop, I've had to say this because we got emails after that and we've gotten them ever since. Thank you, Councillor Wardrop from Brooks, Alberta. Uh, so, Tina, in sorry, Councillor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Airdrie today as of recording this episode? Um, I think it's the same as everywhere else. It is the affordability issue that's happening, whether that's with housing, whether that's with um, trying to maintain our service levels within a reasonable budget. I mean, uh, it, it's, it kind of amazes me how many times people don't understand that this, that cities run as businesses. We function the same as another business would. So if your business costs are going up, our business costs are going up as well. So um, trying to balance that the service levels out with trying to keep things affordable um, and even just seeing people struggling through the affordability crisis. I mean, my family is not immune to that. Nobody's family is, is, is really immune to that. Um, and just trying to navigate that, keep people housed, keep people fed, keep services running, their, their basic daily need services running. Um, those are always going to be the biggest challenges. And I think it's just been heightened over the last like three, four years where it's harder and harder to, to just keep those basic everyday needs um, in place for people. So that would be, that's the overarching number one biggest thing right now, for sure. Now, that is not just a municipal issue. That's a federal issue. That's a provincial issue. But municipalities play a role in sort of either exacerbating or sort of helping the affordability uh, crisis. Now, I can imagine the last few years have been tough. And I'd say the last few years since we got out of the, the pandemic, 2021 budget, 2022 budget, 2023 budget, and now you're heading into budgets if they haven't even, if they haven't already started the budget process for 2024, um, you're looking at issues that are probably looking at cost of living, cost of doing services, cost of doing business, construction costs are all going through the roof. And you can't, you know, you can't do that on the back of your people, but you know that you have to continuously grow the community because Airdrie is a growing community. I don't care who you yeah. are. Your city is growing at an amazing rate. And I think that's great. How do you balance that then? Because I can imagine it is tough knowing that yeah. if you cut service levels, that means people who are you are utilizing those services are going to not be able to utilize them. If you increase taxes, that means that someone may not be able to put food on their table that week. Yeah. It is a tough challenge. And for you, who have said, who has openly said that your your empathy is on full blast 24-7 when you make decisions, I can imagine it is just mentally draining on you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's amazing because my family doesn't actually understand why sometimes I sleep in my jeans on the couch because I don't actually make it upstairs. I'm just so exhausted all the time. Um, a lot of it's self-inflicted because I tend to do everything that I can. Like I don't take a lot of breaks. Um, and I just went off topic there. But um, I think, and I, I don't ever like to say that, you know, other municipalities aren't facing this, but you brought up Airdrie's growth. And I think that's one of our, why we're so unique here that we, like we doubled our population in a decade and we don't have the infrastructure to support that. And we also 
because of the affordability issues, because of the cuts in MSI, and because of all that stuff, we're really struggling to get there. Um, and we never would want to put our, our city in a situation where we're anywhere near those provincially um, mandated debt limits. Like we want to make sure we're always under that so that we're always being very fiscally responsive, uh, responsible. So um, it, it's a tough balance. And we as council have to sit there and make really tough choices. Um, you know, let's delay this project. We're not going to, we're not going to stop it, we're, but we may, we can push this off a little bit. And we don't like to do that, right? Because if we could give everybody all the infrastructure they wanted today, we'd do it. Um, but it's just trying to figure out what the biggest need is that will, um, I, I don't even like to say serve the biggest population, but benefit the biggest population because um, there's so many offshoots of things like we can build a rec center. It's not just for health and wellness, but it's for um, meeting rooms or it's for those nonprofits or whatever that looks like. So it's the biggest benefit to the community. Um, so yeah, it has been a lot of really, really tough choices over the last probably two years. Um, and COVID's kind of kicked that off where we had to defer stuff, delay stuff. But um, yeah, our growth pressures are just making it really hard. And I always like to um, maybe, it's not a dig at the provincial government, but I appreciate the Alberta is calling campaign. I bring all the people, we want all the people, but we also need the money to support the people that they're bringing here. So for hospitals, for schools, like Airdrie is drastically underserved when it comes to school capacity. We have some schools that are at about 109% capacity right now in our high schools. And we just have nowhere to put the kids anymore. <laughs> yeah. So so we're having to, like our school board is getting very creative in, in our schools, you know, but that means dropping those, um, dropping the arts programs sorry <laughs> so dropping some of those programs that our kids need even though they're not the core subjects they they need them so we can't drop those subjects and we can't cut them out but we have no space left it's it's tough and i can imagine for someone like yourself watching People's struggle is probably hard because you, you've been active in your community for so long. You've seen the highs and lows of your community. And right now they're going through some lows, but they're also going through some highs. You have new infrastructure projects that are opening and you are part of a council that needs to sort of weigh the pros and cons of every decision. And it yeah. seems like you're doing that correctly. Um, but I want to, I want to sort of flip the script now. And if you listen to the show, you know what the flip the script on this question means. If I go talk to 100 people in Airdrie, which ironically I have, <laughs> and I ask them what their biggest issue is, yes, I would say the majority of them would probably say the affordability crisis, but they're going to give me some of the other issues as well. They're going to give me the micro issues, that pothole that has been the bane of their existence, that sidewalk that looks cracked in front of their house that they have to clear and it doesn't get cleared as often as they want. Um and you, as a counselor, have to balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual, because you can't yeah. forget about the individual. How do you do that? How do you balance the needs of the individual, making sure that people feel like their issues are being heard, but also not being shoved aside because yeah. you just don't have enough money or you just can't do it that year for that pothole or that road or that increased pool hours or add a new this, that, or the other. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? Um, well, you take each, and like, like I said at the beginning, you take everything as a, okay, how do we get to the next step? So if I have a resident that comes forward and they have a pothole problem, let's fix that pothole. Like, Maybe it's just that our staff didn't know about the pothole. Like, let's let's get a call out there. And then if they tell me that there's a reason that they're not fixing the pothole, then we'll take it from there and see if there's a policy decision. Maybe this is something that's affecting people on a larger scale. Um, so it's taking each request as an individual request, seeing if you can fix it, seeing if it's part of a larger problem, um, and then figuring out the solution from there. I would say the majority of the problems that people come to me with, with the exception of hospitals, <laughs> and schools that I cannot fix for them. Um, I can keep harassing people and I'm very good at harassing people. I am a nag when it comes to our provincial and federal government and I will never apologize for that, but I'm a nag in the nicest possible way. But um, but yeah, so the majority of the, the issues that come, they're like, you know, you know, we noticed that this intersection isn't really safe for the kids when they're crossing. Okay, let's make it safe. Um, or, you know, 
I don't like my garbage being picked up in the back alley because of such and such and I can't get it there. So let's figure out if there's another way. Can we move this this to the to the other side of your home, right? So it is just taking things on a case by case basis, figuring out if you can fix it immediately or if it's a long term fix. Um, but I, I can know. imagine there's some pie in the sky issues that people come up with, right? Always. And I say pie in the sky. Yeah. I don't paint a broad stroke when I say that. I just yeah. because there's probably going to be someone says we need a new pool. We need yeah. a new this. We need a new fire hall. We need this, that, or the other. I need more police in my part of the city compared to this part of the city, so yeah. on and so forth. And you know, that's not feasible. I don't care how you do it. Yeah. Okay, let's let's take the pool for an example. If someone wants a new pool or increased pool services, you have to look at the budget. And if the budget's not there, you have to say no. And yeah. that is probably the hardest thing that a counselor can say, particularly in any election year, but any time when you're dealing with people who would potentially vote for you. How do you how do you respectfully say no to people who have issues or want things that you know the city can't deliver? If I could be extremely honest with this, I, I don't do it. Let's do it, Tina. Come on. Honesty is the best example. I, I don't say no. Because I'm not in a position to say no. I'm, it, it could be maybe in 10 years. It could be maybe let's figure out if we can find a private partnership to partner with us on this to make it happen. I rarely just flat out say no. I mean, there has there's maybe been one or two times where I've been like, no, that is not happening. Um, but it's very, very, very rare that I would say that to somebody because there's always a way to make something happen. Maybe it won't get to their plan A, but maybe we get to a plan D that works for everybody, right? So um, yeah, I rarely say no, just flat out no. Good for you. I'm <laughs> um, I'm surprised that most more counselors don't give that answer, but okay. here we are in 2023. <laughs> I, I want to turn to my last subject because I, we're 35 minutes in and I know you're a busy person. So I want to make sure I give you enough time to sort of relax before your next meeting. And I want to ask about a subject that's very important to me. I think tourism is something that municipalities need to do a better job at. I think tourism is something that Canadians need to do a better job at, especially touring our great communities that we have here in Canada. And I think every community has hidden gems. So I'm going to ask you the sort of the million dollar before the million dollar question, the half million dollar question, what are some of the hidden gems in the city of Airdrie that you tell tourists to go see when they're in your community? Uh, there, there's quite a few, but I, I will highlight. So I don't know, have you ever seen Iron Horse Park in Airdrie? So mm. I, Iron Horse Park is actually, it's been there forever. It's buried in the middle of our community. You would never know that it's there unless somebody tells you, but it is a, and I can't remember the scale, but it is a miniature railroad that there's a bunch of like, you know, people who used to be ex conductors or engineers or whatever. And they have now volunteered their time and they have built this incredible place where you can actually ride a train from Airdrie to Vancouver and back to Airdrie. You ride on this train, they built all the tracks, they built all the tunnels, the bridges. Um, and yeah, and you ride on these and they're, um, they have a steam powered one and a gas powered one, I believe. Um, and yeah, and they all dress up as conductors and they tell you all about everything between here and Airdrie. Um, and it's two bucks. <laughs> it's two bucks a ride. <laughs> So <laughs> is that in your and mine future in the next few weeks then to come out uh, to Airdrie? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, they may be having their last weekend this weekend because they close down in October because it gets cold. So they're open from like May to uh, or April to October, I think. Um, but yeah, it's it's so just I it's, might be coming out then. <laughs> yeah, I will find the information and I will send it to you. And they also do fundraisers for our food bank throughout the year. So if you bring a food bank donation, it's free to ride the train. Um, so it's it's just this amazing thing, and um, it's a great partnership with the city. So the city leases them the land for I think a dollar a year, um, so that they can have this parcel of land that's untouched, and that every year they just keep adding more and more and more and more. And it's it's a great tourism place. So check it out for sure. Um, but we have so many cool little businesses here. We have um, we have uh, so the Airdrie Ale Trail. So if you're into microbreweries and stuff, we actually on our City of Airdrie website have a map of all these breweries. So you can go and visit one after the other. And it just so happens that our new 40th Avenue interchange completes that ale trail. So you can go right across from King's Heights over there. Um, and honestly, that industry in our community is um, 
I don't ever like to like hype one up over the other because they have all amazing businesses. But that is a group of businesses that know that working together is how they win. Um, so they'll go out and they'll do, you know, they'll make beers together. They'll make th this certain type of beers and they'll all like sell it at their different breweries and they get together for photo ops and they do events together and they do, you know, come to 948 Brewing, Brewing and Atlas Brewing. We're having the same event at the same time. So go to whichever one, it doesn't matter. And it, it's rare to see that in industry that they're not competing, they're working together and it works. They all win. So, yeah. So where can we find you after a long day of work, after a long day of volunteering, because it seems like you still do that. Where can we find you after a stressful day, knowing that tomorrow you're going to be back at it, doing the exact same thing? Is there a local business? Is there a trail system? Is there a couch in your house that you just go and let it all decompress? Or where, where, where does where does Tina go to just let it all go? So I'm going to shock you here that I am actually a very introverted person. I am a homebody. I like, I like people and I love talking to people, but I also love just being at home. I love being at home. I am so on our council. I'm definitely the urban agriculture person. I'm the food sustainability person. I garden all the time. I have a massive veggie garden here and I, um, I have a very strong belief that we should be feeding our people from our own communities. Um, we should not be trucking in food from elsewhere on the planet. We should be growing here, feeding our people here. Um, I'll put a plug in for geothermal power to power the greenhouses that we use to grow our food for our residents. But um, yeah, and, and then I like, um, I, I meal, I, I'm a bit of a ur urban homesteader. So I meal prep 30 days at a time. I love to make sure my family has healthy food even when I'm not here, because I'm rarely here, um, especially now with my new AB Muni's role, like it's, I'm, I'm never going to be home. But, um, but yes, yeah, so you can find me cooking, gardening, or sitting on my couch. That's pretty much it. So I've got to ask, you brought it up. So I'm going to, I'm going to poke the bear a little bit here. Um, you decided to put your name forward for director of cities under 500,000, if I'm not mistaken, for the Alberta Municipalities Board of Directors. What was the decision based on there? And well, first off, congratulations on being uh, uh, elected to the role. But uh, what was the decision and what do you hope to achieve over the next two years in that role? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I've sat on the Sustainability and Environment Committee um, for the last three years with AB Munis. Um, and it's a great group of people who bring a very diverse group of voices to the table. Um, I absolutely love sitting and chatting with people from like summer villages and then city of Edmonton, right? Because the perspectives are so different. The problems are generally the same, but the, but the how you get there and how you achieve it, those are all different in between. Um, so I our mayor was a director up until this year with AB Muni. So um, when he let me know that he wasn't running again, it did feel like kind of that natural progression to go from the committee meetings to a little bit of a bigger role and dealing with a broader subset of topics. Like I'm really excited to dive. I told everybody when they asked me what I hope to achieve, I said, well, I'm going to solve LGFF. That's going to be the first thing that I'm going to do. Um, and then we'll work on the housing crisis and then we'll just keep moving our way down. But um I'm really hoping to get on safe and healthy communities. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a group in the province called the Inner City Forum on Social Policy. Um, so I've been chairing that for the last two years um, and also chairing a um, subcommittee on mental health. Mental health is a big driver for me. I probably spend about 60% of my time working on that. Um, so I'd love to get on safe and healthy. I don't know if that's where they're putting me. Apparently they've already decided where I'm going. I just don't know yet. So I'll find out at the end of October. But, um, but yeah, it's just a great group of people. And I learn so, so, so much from them. Um, Mayor Gandam and Peter DeMong, I've been sitting with him for three years on s &E and um, yeah, just, oh, the wealth of knowledge that those people have in their brains and just even tap into a tiny bit of that. I know it'll help me personally. It'll help my municipality um, and hopefully the province as well. So. Okay. I'm going to ask one last question. I'm going to preface it again by saying this is a conversation between the Alberta Municipalities board member and Chris, and I want you to put your on AB Munis. What do you see as the biggest challenges municipalities face over the next few years? Um, so I'm going to say that I probably am, can't comment on that at this time. <laughs> um, I'm still going through my orientation and my training and everything with them. So I wouldn't want to speak at a turn as far as what AB Munis sees as the biggest um, challenge. 
my personal hunch is going to be um, affordability. It's going to be that funding. It's going to no that's understandable. Personal, yeah, that's my personal feeling on it. But again, I I just I haven't gone through far enough through. I'll say my basic training. I feel like I'm in the military now, but I haven't gone through basic training yet. So I want to hold off on those questions until I have a bit more behind me. Hey, I was at that convention. It felt like very rigorous military precision going on there because it was the first convention I've been at where it actually ran on time and things were yeah. happening on time. It was like, whoa, what's this all about? Um, so I'm going to ask the final question here, Tina, and then I'm going to let you go. But I want to ask... The million dollar question. I think every municipal leader needs to be able to answer this question. I think they all have answered this question, but you need to be able to pull it out of your hat within a moment's notice. What makes the city of Airdrie such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Uh, I actually just spoke to this earlier today, and I will say there, there's a couple different things in this. I'm sorry, this is not going to be a short answer. But at the end of the day, it's always the people. We always say it's the people, right? But very specific examples, and I'm going to cry. Holy cow, am I going to cry? But when I go outside of my municipality and I'm telling people why this is the only place I would ever live, I go back to this story, and it was quite a few years ago. There was a, a dog that went missing in our community. And the dog wasn't from our community. They were visiting from somewhere else. I think they were from Calgary. And they were here, and it was middle of winter brutally cold outside I think it reached like minus 35 minus 40 something that night and this dog was missing <laughs> and thousands of Aerodronians went out looking for this dog at minus 35 minus 40 and um we're offering the gentleman who lost his dog you know food and snowsuits and gloves and all this stuff and a place to come in and get warm and that is what makes our community so special and I know you can generically say the people, but that specific instance is what made me know that I had made the right choice of where I wanted to live and where I wanted to represent the people. And then even this, um, the fundraiser I was doing for the Airdrie Food Bank over the last month, the the food bank here was struggling a bit as, as they are everywhere, right? Supplies were low and they put a call out to the community just saying, you know, we had to cancel one of our volunteer shifts just because we didn't have enough stuff for them to do. We didn't have enough food for them to move around. Um, and since then, every business, every person has stepped up either with a donation or a campaign, or um, I think our last food drive collected like 63,000 pounds of food. Like, it's incredible how much this community steps up when, when people are in need. And so I tell them when I said, don't believe what you read on Facebook. Because that's like eight people that don't even live here. <laughs> so don't read the comments on Facebook. Think about the people that are in your neighborhood. And when you need help, they're going to be there for you every single time. So that's my long answer for that one. But it's the people. It's an honest answer. I don't care if it's <laughs> long. I don't care if it's short. It's a truly honest answer. And I thank you for that. I, I, I truly thank you for uh, doing this. Um I, I'm glad that we were able to connect. I'm glad you walked up to me at Alberta Municipalities and we were able to figure out a way to get my email through. And maybe it was just that picture, but I appreciate you saying yes to coming on the show. And I say this with sincerity, and I think most people need to start saying it to our elected officials, but thank you. Thank you for serving our community. Um, I don't think municipal politicians get the thanks that they deserve because you have to make some tough choices. And I can imagine it is tough on your mental health, even just your family as well. So thank you for stepping up, for being part of your community and making your city a better place. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, Tina, for doing this. I really appreciate, and I appreciate what you're doing, highlighting municipal politicians. It you are right. It is a fairly thankless job, except for this one time that some people said thank you in a parade to us once. Um, but overall, it is. And um, we do it because we love it. We don't do it for the money, clearly, if anybody sees <laughs> the dollars. Um, we do it because we love the places that we live and we want to make them better for us, for our families and for everyone who lives here for the future. Um, if I could throw one more tiny plug out, because you just said mental health for politicians. Um, I've been the Alberta Municipalities representative on the peer mentor network for municipal dispute resolution for the last three years. Um, not enough municipal politicians know that that exists and that that is a support for them. So if you are a, we don't get mental health help. We really don't. So if you are a municipal elected official and you are struggling with anything, whether it's just something that's going on in your council and you need to talk to somebody, that is where you call. We're all sitting here. We always 
encourage people to call and would love to chat with you. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.